escape pod. 8 squared. July 27th, 2006. Today's story, Head of State, by Ed W. Marsh. Hello, I'm Steve Ely, and welcome to Escape Pod number 64. As a programmer, that's at least as cool to me as number 50. And hey, any excuse to celebrate. We're doing a few things differently this week, and I'll start that here in the intro by asking you all for a couple of favors. The first favor relates to Worldcon, and I hope it's a good opportunity for someone out there. The World Science Fiction Convention is in Anaheim, California this year, August 23rd through 27th. I mentioned before that I was hoping to throw some parties there. Well, it's official now. There is a podcast party suite confirmed. The parties will be presented by myself and Evo Terra of Patio Books and the Dragon Page, and sponsored by Podcast Ready. Of course you're all invited, so here's where the favor comes in. Neither Evo nor I have any serious experience at throwing big open parties, and we're hoping to recruit someone who can take over some of the planning and logistics. If you're going to Worldcon, or you live in LA, and you're a caterer or event planner, or you've just thrown a lot of con parties, please drop me a line at editor at escapepod.org. Tell us about your experience, and we'll see what we can make work. We have a budget for materials, and for your time, we can offer two full memberships to all four days of the con. At current rates, that's a $400 value, so we're serious about wanting somebody to help. The other favor is for a friend of mine, Scott Sigler. You may know him from, well, everything. He's been working with a production company to make a pitch to the Sci-Fi Channel for a movie based on his novel Ancestor. Now, if you listen to the podcast of Ancestor, and you've ever seen a movie on the Sci-Fi Channel, you know that this is a perfect match. It's guaranteed to be better than Mansquito or Chupacabra Dark Seas. But the crazy thing is, they turned it down. Said they didn't want a monster they had to explain. So Scott wants to mobilize the podcasting community, maybe show them how big a market there already is for this story, and it sounded like a fun idea, so I'm passing the word. If you would like to see Ancestor as a creature feature on sci-fi, what he's asking you to do is take two minutes and send a polite email to feedback at sci-fi.com saying, I'd love to see Scott Sigler's Ancestor on sci-fi. With a few thousand emails like that, you never know what might happen. We'll have a link to his page on the show notes. And with that, on to today's story. We present Head of State by Ed W. Marsh. It's a story about a haircut, but lofty, noble, tragic, timeless, full of love, treachery, retribution, quiet heroism in the face of certain doom. Six lines, cleverly rhymed, and every word beginning with the letter S. Oh, wait, that last part was the Siberiad. But this is a really good story about a haircut. Mr. Marsh among various short fiction accomplishments, is the best-selling author of the -the behind-the-scenes book for James Cameron's Titanic. This story is an escape pod debut, and at the author's request, part of the payment for the story has been donated to Doctors Without Borders. And for something truly different, this week's story was read and produced by the one and only Wichita Rutherford of the 5 Minutes with Wichita podcast. Wichita has read for us before. Connie Maybe is still one of our most popular pieces. And one thing I've learned is that if Wichita offers to do something, it's best to stand back and let him do it the Wichita way. So I'll let him take it from here, and then it's story time. Hello there! I'm Wichita Rutherford, and I'm going to read you a story, and boy, it's a good one, too! It's called Head of State. It's true. This fellow named Ed W. Marsh done wrote it. Oh, it's going to put you on edge of your seat. Ain't it, Mitchell? <laughs> That's right. All right, then, here we go. Head of State by Ed W. Marsh. Franklin Morrison sat in the waiting room with his little instrument case and sat on his lap, feeling terribly underdressed. He thought about putting on his apron. He knew this simple little ritual would help with his nerves and probably contribute to a good first impression on his new client. But before he could open his case, the auto sec asked him to proceed into General Adam Chick's private office. The door slid open. Have a seat. Adam Chick stood behind an executive desk that was obviously from a different time. 
Now, the size was huge. He was ridiculous, holding nothing but a terminal and a little ashtray, and he was a little antique, too. The general was absent-mindedly and gnawing on the cigar while he reviewed a thin sheaf of papers. Franklin sat into the leather chair, still keeping his little instruments on his lap. He wasn't used to being the one in the chair. Mr. Morrison, do you know why you, of all the other barbers in the world, were chosen for this honor? I assume the computer picked me at random. The general chuckled. No, Mr. Morrison, we wouldn't let just anyone apply his trade on our head of state. It's your whole old-fashioned approach. But lots of barbers still use scissors and combs. Some people don't like the nanotech, myself included. Thought of tiny little machines are swarming over my head and nibbling down my hair at little preset lengths while I sleep just disgusts me. Now before the change, my country had problems with lice. The similarities are too vivid in my mind. Let's just say that of all the barbers in the world still of the old school, I found your work to be the most agreeable. Franklin smiled nervously. He knew what that meant. It meant he was the safest. Now, the change had led to endless political upheaval in most parts of the world, his country included. Franklin had managed to dodge all that somehow, quietly but firmly supporting Arrington's global plan, until he found himself part of a safe majority. As the transport rose up out of the United Nations compound, the white nothingness of Antarctica seemed to swallow them. Even though the cabin was heated, Franklin involuntarily shivered. They headed due south. Over the rotors, the general had to shout for Franklin to hear. You know, there's a reason we don't use the nano to cut the president chairman's hair. You know about the assassination attempt three years ago? Everyone did. I thought he was fully recovered. What's left of him, yeah. All of that civilian nano would interfere with the signal sent and received by the nano used by the med techs. Can't risk it. That bomb was nasty. Why I'm telling you is classified, obviously. We have no intention of presenting Arrington to the world as less than the man he deserves to be. Classified. Well, that was it then. He was committed. The rest of the trip was spent in silence. Franklin imagined the president chairman, legless in a wheelchair. What was so bad about that? Perhaps his arms was gone, and he wore one of them prosthesis vests that was so common in the aftermath of the change. Or maybe his face was horribly scarred. He knew a lot could be hidden with makeup and image processing. He tried to recall if anything had seemed odd about the president chairman after he had recovered enough from the bomb to resume his regular broadcasts. And nothing came to mind. The general sent and received code clearances to get them through the maze of force fields, and within minutes, they had reached the heart of the first successful world government. One massive black cube rested in the snow, surrounded by the southern lights effect of the force fields. It was an elevator, and they descended. More security, badges, voice prints. His case was cataloged, and each instrument was carefully demagnetized and sterilized. After that, he was explained he was not to take off any of his anti-static slippers for any reason whilst he's in the complex. They replaced his apron with a non-porous equivalent. It felt all slimy. Then, General Adamchick led him into the President Chairman's antechamber. A sea of bald-headed, silver-eyed zombies simultaneously glanced up from their screens. They was the med techs. The General nodded slightly and they all turned back to their work. The only light in the massive room come from hundreds of monitors casting everything in a steely blue. This is only half of the operation, said the general. We have a duplicate group of people monitoring the same information on the other side of Arrington's office. For security reasons, the chem lab is on that side too. Franklin could not help but stir. There was at least a hundred med techs there. What was wrong with the president chairman? The general prodded at Franklin and pointed him toward a door. Its antique oak construction stood out in the surgical surroundings. Go on in, Mr. Morrison, said the general. He's expecting you, and you'll see for yourself how desperate our situation is. Franklin started forward when the general took his arm. One more thing. You needn't worry about facial hair. We'll remove it with electrolysis. Franklin stepped forward and knocked. Come in! The door opened onto a small but stately office. Marble walls with inset bookcases largely obscured by a ring of displays alive with news and statistical analysis. It was jarred for Morrison to think that this room was inside a much vaster space, like some kind of movie set or museum exhibit or something. 
It was even weirder when he noticed that the view outside the windows wasn't even of Antarctica, but of the Grand Canyon. The sun was a-setting, casting everything in a warm amber glow. It's a hologram, the voice said. One of the few concessions they've allowed me, given my present condition. So is the fireplace. Given the small size of the office, it took Franklin a rather embarrassingly long time to spot President Chairman Arrington. But then he had not really known what he was looking for. The complex equipment, cables, and technology of the other room invaded only one place on the inside. A solid column of fiber optics, fluid peristaltic cables, and other assorted tubes and wires and stuff rose up into the center of the office. At their summit, a single human head. It was President Chairman Arrington. Now, Franklin thought he was looking at the back of the head. But when Arrington pursed his lips to send a blast of air upwards, the wispy gray strands flew up and revealed a wizened eye. May I call you Franklin, Mr. Martin? After a long, nervous pause, during which the hair settled back down into place, Franklin managed to respond. Uh, yes, please. Would you like a drink? No. I'm sorry my hair is such a mess. Normally I let them comb it and tie it back, but I thought you might like to see it in its natural state, so to speak. Arrington smiled mysteriously. But please, do take your time. I'm not allowed visitors, and I do so love to chat. Franklin lifted the man's hair and smoothed it back, revealing the most famous face in the whole wide world. The face that had unified all nations into one. The change. The phrase was inadequate, but most everyone liked its generic utility. Used broadly, it referred to the period of time after all the oil run out and civilization tanked. One day, several books would be written about the boneheaded wars that followed as desperate nations exhausted their dwindling reserves, trying to take over other nations with even smaller dwindling reserves. Oh, now it was a mess. There's chaos and famine, and it's all fueled by ancient hatreds and excessive weapon stockpiles. Franklin had been lucky enough to be part of a collective hunker down, and that's a rare combination of effective law enforcement and an acknowledgement from everyone, thankfully, in the rural community that it was time to plant crops and return to the barter system. Now, Arrington, he was unique, not because he had seen the change coming and tried to do something about it, but because most of his plans had worked. A scientist by training with a gift for public speaking, he found an international supporters who shared his vision, and together, they'd accomplish a hunker down on a much grander scale. Seed repositories located all over the globe, geothermal energy farms in Iceland, massive caches of medicines, and libraries in scores of different languages explaining the survival skills that every community's gonna need since they wasn't gonna have an energy grid. Unlike similar efforts, Arrington's programs was shared openly and collectively with no religious or political strings attached. People will remember that fact later on. And then, there's the Nanos, the littlest engines that could. It was now widely known that Arrington had coordinated and funded frantic efforts to mature this technology in an effort to fill the cheap energy void. The gamble had paid off in ways too numerous to count. The change was starting to encompass this more optimistic period of time as well. I'll need some place to put my equipment. Arrington whispered into a little microphone. A moment later, a med tech wheeled in a small little work table. They pay very careful attention to me here. Again, that mysterious little smile. It was unnerving. Somehow, it just didn't fit his features. Franklin opened up his case and began laying out his tools. Scissors, razors, combs. His brushes had been substituted. It made the president chairman a little easier to look at once the customer smock had been draped around the column of tubes and wires and that little chatter near piece had been tucked out of his ear. Mirror! It was a command. Four displays in front of the two men merged into a single magnified image, a reflection of the room that made Franklin dizzy. He had seen this image on the net many times whenever Arrington had addressed the citizens of the world. The image showed the man, the whole man, seated in a stately chair, massaging his fingers against the upholstery. As Arrington tilted his head or spoke, the movement was mimicked in the image. 
The computer-generated illusion was very convincing. I've become rather attached to this haircut. Can you match it? I think so. Controlling the nervousness in his hands, he started to comb and separate the president chairman's mane of hair. A tarred lion. That was a fitting image. As if someone had taken an aging lion and mounted its head up for display, making a joke of what little dignity remained in the eyes after death. Normally, Franklin liked to talk with his customers. It was part of the ritual. But for the life of him, he didn't know where to begin. Uh, how long has it been since your last haircut, sir? It seemed safe enough, and it was certainly appropriate to ask a new customer. Since the assassination attempt, the slicer bomb was very effective, even if it did go off too soon. I guess I should thank God that our medical technology has advanced as it has. Sometimes, I wonder. Again, that damn smile. To be honest with you, it was an oversight. Only Adam Chick and three or four other med techs are allowed in here. The rest of the world sees that cartoon. Even I see that cartoon. <laughs> he laughed an odd, bitter laugh. Franklin worked on finding the remnants of the man's part. They also saved one of my arms, you know. Or did anyone bother to tell you? I could actually hold things and sign my name. I even had a real mirror. <laughs> now the president chairman was giggling, openly. Something was definitely wrong. Was it possible that Arrington was insane? You know why they took it away? <laughs> he said between gasps. Gasps made all the more noticeable for the fact that Franklin had to wonder where Arrington was getting the air. Obviously, it came up through the column from somewhere, along with everything else. The more Arrington laughed, however, the more conflicted his facial muscles became. It was as if invisible hands were trying to force his mouth shut and press the edges of his mouth back to the safe, neutral center. You idiots! I want to feel this! Let me feel this! <laughs> the laughing turned into gasps, and then sighs of deep, almost sexual satisfaction. Then his eyes rolled up in his head and he passed out. Franklin ran out of the room. Something's wrong! He shouted to Adam Chick, who was standing over at Med Tech. Relax, he just got a little excited. What did you just do? We stimulated the pleasure center of his limbic node. A gentle mix of endorphins and neural stimulation. He's fine. We didn't think it was in our best interest to allow such an outburst right now. We're expecting an important decision from China today. He'll need to respond. What? Franklin couldn't believe it. Most of these med techs, he realized, was the monitoring and adjusting the brain functions. You control his thoughts? Let me explain something, Mr. Morrison. Ours is a fledgling government. I don't have to tell you that people like Arrington come along once in a million years. No one else could have kept the alliances he's forged together. Thanks to him, we're all one people, but for the most part, it's still an illusion. No lie there. The worst chaos of the change was firmly in the past, but this didn't mean it was any easier for various ethnic and religious groups to work together than it had been in the past. The stress cracks were in the news every night. Arrington kept it together through a skillful combination of diplomacy and nanotech. The benefits of cooperation was good for every citizen. Arrington is a symbol, said the general in a quiet voice. A symbol that works, that makes decisions that others respect. Let's suppose I were to take his place, something I never intend to do as long as I live. But if he was to die and I was to take his place, I could follow his plans to the letter and I would still be branded for Russian favoritism because of my history. Arrington was all things to all people. He makes it work. But you control his mind! Franklin was momentarily sickened by the thought of med techs watching the president chairman's dreams. That's an exaggeration. We've mapped his mind. In our work, we have to systematically stimulate almost 20% of his synapses. We're trying to map his life experiences, too. Why? That's classified. Why'd you take his arm away? That, too, is classified. You're a smart man. I think you can guess what happened. We map his mind and we encourage specific emotional responses. Anything more, and he'd be no good to us. But he's suicidal. How's that possibly useful to you? You're making a conclusion based on his response moments ago. Most of that was the president chairman trying to fight our calming response. He's aware of the fact that we influence his emotions, even if he doesn't know how. 
On his own, his depression is due to the fact that he has no physical body. It don't affect his decisions regarding the rest of the world. He simply doesn't want to live this way. We're working on that, too. The general led Franklin away from the monitors and back toward the oak door. There's many ways for a mind to go insane, he said. The president chairman is slowly trying them all, whether he knows it or not. With our methods, an arsenal of brain-active catalysts are keeping him sane. I'm sure that when he really thinks about it, he knows it's for the best. When he really thinks about it, Franklin thought, you dope him up and make him forget. The general opened the door and motioned Franklin back into Arrington's office. It should go better this time. When Franklin re-entered the room, Arrington looked like he was in a deep and happy sleep. Then, just as long as it took a med tech to pump in the new cocktail, he'd come awake, looking somewhat hungover and embarrassed. They're trying to clone me now, you know. That's my only hope. If and when they succeed, I only hope my brain is still worth something to somebody. He raised his head bravely and closed his eyes for a moment. Forgive me. Please continue. Franklin began again. He confined himself to small talk, and Arrington did the same for the most part. Once, they was interrupted by news from China. Apparently, the Chinese sub-Congress had respectfully rejected the Honorable President Chairman's proposal to repatriate the millions who had fled China during the change in search of marriage-aged women, the end result of a pre-change political policy that had limited Chinese families to having only one child in a culture where male children were more culturally desirable. To Arrington, it was a little more than a hiccup, the remnant of an older history refusing to fade away. Much as the U.S. federal government had holed itself up in Washington and still claimed sovereignty illegally over territory that was now just part of the North Alliance, he would make the proposal again in five years. By then, he mused, the rest of the Pacific states of Japan would be reacquiring some of that island's former glory and China would gladly accept the families into their diminishing workforce. Maybe the general was right. Maybe life on the end of a pole was a necessary sacrifice that Arrington had to make. But shouldn't that be Arrington's decision? With an army of med techs ready to pounce on any negative anomaly in his thought patterns, he was forever denied the choice. He was the man run by committee. As they cut Arrington's hair, Franklin could sense the unseen flow of blood, nutrients, and brain chemicals, all handpicked by Adamchick to keep Arrington the hero the world needed. Franklin removed the smock and folded it neatly into his bag. Mirror, said Arrington. The screens came to life, revealing exactly what they had revealed before. No change. Then, Franklin pulled out a real mirror for the president chairman to gaze into. Franklin watched Arrington's eyes. For a long time, they did not look at the haircut or even his face. They was focused on the electronic guts of the column on which his head rested. Franklin knew this was the very sight that had caused the president chairman to pull himself off the column using his own arm, and he knew this is why the general took the arm away. Never once, as far as Franklin could tell, did he actually look at the haircut. You do good work, Franklin. How about a shave? As he said it, Arrington lifted up his chin, offering his neck to the newly appointed official barber. The skin was perfectly smooth. But sir, you don't need a shave. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Forgive me. But Arrington did not drop his head. He stared at Franklin with an intensity that was unmistakable, and when a hint of the artificial smile began to play on his lips, Franklin knew he had no choice. When he lifted the razor from the table and exposed the sharp edge, the president chairman's smile became very big and very, very real. In the antechamber, an alarm sounded on the screens of the med techs. Okay? He's monitoring the limbic node. Uh, what, what, uh, Nothing to worry about. Sure? Yeah. Yeah, just, In uh, fact, but it was almost a reason to celebrate. Okay. For the first time in a long while, the president chairman was experiencing some joy. By the time the other alarm started screaming, it was too late. And that was our story. I told you it was a bit different. Thanks again to Wichita for putting it all together. If you'd like to hear more stories given a rich production like that, please feel free to comment and let us know. 
I can just about guarantee that we won't do it every week. There aren't enough hours in the day for us. But if you like it, we'll do it when we think it'll be fun. Just a couple of points of feedback this week. First, I wanted to make mention of an interesting thread that's going on in the comments section of the post for Mer Lafferty's story, I look forward to remembering you. We got a comment from Joseph, who took exception to the sexual content of the story. He feels that an overt emphasis on premarital sex and culture creates a destructive social influence. And that, of course, prompted some debate from others. What really impressed me about this discussion is how polite it's been. Joseph presented his opinion clearly and thoughtfully, and others have responded in kind. There have been no insults, no swearing, not even any bad grammar. And that deepens my conviction that we have the coolest and most intelligent audience on the planet. Here's some more evidence. I got an email from Evo the other day, passing along some comments from an associate, who said, You told me about Escape Pod, right? I've listened to a few, and wow are they great. Thanks for the tip. Those lines came from Will Wheaton. Yes, that Will Wheaton, icon of geek culture. So thanks, Will. I'm glad you're enjoying it, and if you'd like to read a story for us, please drop me a line anytime. And finally, one more email. This one comes from Mike Resnick. He wrote the other day to tell me, Three months ago, I had never heard the word podcast. Today, I sold a movie option because a French director-producer heard your podcast of Down Memory Lane, fell in love with it, and contacted me. Now that just floored me. I knew we were having some good success, but that's the first time I've heard of Escape Pod leading to bigger deals for an author. Congratulations, Mike. For the rest of you who enjoyed it, we're buying a couple more Mike Resnick stories, including one Hugo winner. In his case, I realize that's not specific at all. Whew! Escape Pod is a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. All other rights are reserved by our authors, which means Mike gets his money and I get to hit him up for drinks. Our music is by permission of Dai Kaiju. Find them online at daikaiju.org. And that was our show for this week. We close with... Ah, what the hell. Stanislaw Lem's Siberiad. Seduced, shaggy Samson snored. She scissored short, sorely shorn, soon shackled slave. Samson sighed, silently scheming, sightlessly seeking, some savage, spectacular suicide. That was our show for this week. Until next week, have fun.